This is the Everything 80s Podcast, Episode 9, The Story of Alf. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast, brought to you by Everything80sPodcast.com. I'm Jamie. Today we're talking about ALF, aka the television version of E.T., and a lot of amazing stuff that actually went behind that show that I was not aware of. And this just sort of looks into the development of the show, the production, all the backstage drama, all that good stuff. So we'll jump into it in a second but before we start here's the obligatory subscribe to the podcast wherever you find your podcast i should be there okay let's get right into it okay so unless you have worked or developed the muppets it's pretty tough to introduce a puppet based tv show and you know expect it to create a you know cultural significance but for just a quick summary before we get in, ALF was a sitcom that ran from 1986 to 1990 based on an alien that crash landed from the planet Melmac. He'd live with the Tanner family that had to protect his protect his secrecy while at the same time put up with them. And ALF was an unexpected phenomenon that led to a ton of merchandising, spin-off cartoons, and other TV specials. So Disclaimer off the off the start. Alf was honestly one of my all time favorite shows, especially when it first debuted. I think I was right, just around the right age. I was what nine or ten, and I vividly remember watching the premiere episode as a kid and just like dying laughing. It, I don't know it, the sensibility of it just appealed to me so much. Whatever, I was instantly hooked, and to me, it was one of the top shows of the eighties. And like I said, it's funny now to look back on all the crap that went behind this uh, this show that, you know, you don't know it at the time. So, well, in case you are unaware, ALF stands for Alien Life Form, and ALF was technically known as Gordon Shumway from his home planet of Melmac, and Melmac, I believe, was a type of um, porcelain dish or some sort of dinner plate or in the 50s or whatever. I think that's where they got the name. So he crash lands on Earth in the garage of the Tanner family, and they're unsure what to do with them, and they help hide him from the alien task force. So it's found out that Alf's home planet had exploded with Alf, and a few of his friends were able to escape. So a big part of Alf's existence with the Tanner family is having to keep him hidden. And then there's the neighbors. You remember the Achmonics, played by John LaMotta, and Jerry Seinfeld's mother, Liz Sheridan. The show uses that kind of classic fish-out-of-water premise with Alf trying to make sense of his new surroundings and culture while trying to suppress his own bizarre customs, you know, the cat eating and all that sort of thing. It's just sort of that um, cultural misplacement and just, you know, all the wacky shenanigans that would happen with that. Think back like Perfect Strangers and things like that. So there would be some humans he would interact with, including Willie's brother Neil, played by Jim J. Bullock, and Kate's mother, Dorothy, played by Ann Mira, who's the real-life mother of Ben Stiller and wife of Jerry Stiller, a.k.a. Frank Costanza. So some interesting Seinfeld parent connections right here. So from some ALF history, he was born on October 28th, 1756, on the Lower East Side of Melmac, and this is a planet that had green sky, blue grass, and a purple sun. The currency they used on Melmac was called the Wernick, and that was named after the show producer Sandy Wernick. So Alf, j- just to physically describe, is short. He's covered with orange fur. He has eight stomachs, and his heart is located in his right ear. And then if you remember back from the show, a few of his friends from Melmac included Skip, Rock, Stella, and girlfriend Rhonda. And they would always you reference help me Rhonda. Actually every episode was named after a song if you go back and look. So so here's some of the characters on Alf. So Alf himself was done by a guy named Paul Fusco or Fusco. So he did the voice and the puppeteering along with Lisa Buckley and a guy named Bob Fapiano. And Fapiano is the name of a Melmac holiday. So the full shots of Alf, you know, if you remember 
they they only show this in the first like season or two when they would show him like running from a distance. Those full shots were performed by Michu Mazeros in full costume. And Michu was born in 1939 and he was part of Ringling Brothers Circus. And that was his role in the, uh, the show. Willie Tanner, the father of the Tanners, was played by Max Wright. Kate Tanner, the mother, was played by Anne Sheedon. Or Shadeen. Sorry, Anne. Lynn Tanner was played by Andrea Elson, who was also on shows like Who's the Boss, Silver Spoons, Married with Children. Brian Tanner, he was the youngest son. He was played by Benji Gregory. He was on other epic shows such as Punky Brewster. He was on the A-Team. Did a voice on Pound Puppies. He was on TJ Hooker. And another main reoccurring character was Jake Ockmonic, played by Josh Blake. He was nephew of the Ockmonics. He was one of the other people who knew about ALF. So here's... Uh, you know, looking at the production of the series and the development. So Paul Fusco was behind the whole show and he approached the producer, Bernie Brillstein. And he was, he, he approached him about showing off his puppeting ability and about the possibility of doing a show. The problem is Brillstein was a former manager of a somewhat competent puppeteer known as Jim Henson. So, you know, he, he's just, not going to be impressed. He's not. And originally he wasn't even interested as he'd already seen and work with the greatest, you know, puppeteer of all time in Henson. So Fusco was somehow able to convince him, um, and to just, to do like a quick performance, a quick little spiel, whatever, but actually ended up winning Brillstein over with his performance, his comedic ability, his improv ability. Amazing. Like he must, he was obviously that good. Um, to, to, you know, convince this guy who had seen the best of all time. So Fusco would now co-produce a series with Tom Pachette, and it was picked up by Warner Brothers Television and Laura Martell Pictures. So leading up to the initial production of the show, Fusco was really secretive about ALF, and this would kind of be a reoccurring theme over the decades. No one was actually even sure what it was like what Alf was going to look like. They didn't know what he was going to sound like. They didn't even actually know if he'd be an alien. It was a lot of secrecy behind it. So they would finally, like they would bring out the main Alf puppet and that was used on the show. It was the only one and it was meticulously cared for. And to avoid any damage to the main Alf, they used a makeshift puppet called Ralph, rehearsal alien life form to you know just go through the paces in case any accidents or blocking problems or potential damage so the thing is Fusco because he was a real kind of improviser and whatever he was not big on rehearsing and he would sometimes just use his hand to replicate Alf he he really preferred more spontaneity and freshness freshness in his performance kind of like Jackie Gleason if you're familiar with the honeymooners Jackie Gleason never rehearsed uh, I think like they would maybe go over little bits or little technical details, but he had a, a pretty photographic memory so he could just go through the whole thing and the actors just knew they had to go with it. And this is the case with Fusco. He just wanted a lot more freshness and he didn't want it to come, become stale, which is very difficult on a sitcom, you know, like a three camera sitcom. There's not a lot of room for that improvisation. So <clears throat> the whole The whole set of ALF was built on a four-foot platform so Fusco could perform ALF underneath. You probably, if you've ever seen uh, any production stuff to do with like the Muppets or the Muppet show, that was the same thing. Everything was built up and elevated. And even if it's just like a little, I don't know if you think of uh, Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi, it was the same thing. Everything would be built up so... In that case, Frank Oz could be underneath to control. So then the whole, like when you've, if you've seen the show, you know, like the main areas where the show's filmed are the living room and the kitchen. And then they would have stuff in the garage, but that was the primary stage focus was in those rooms. So that everything you're looking at there is an elevated stage, four feet off the ground. And the entire set is filled with trap doors. So Alf could basically appear anywhere on the set. So, when you look at it, it just looks like a normal staged setup house production. But there's, I can't remember when I was looking back. I mean, if you remember the show, there was multiple places where Alf would pop up. He would, uh, by the couch and by the table, 
uh, like the coffee table and then the living room table, then behind the couch, then in the back corner and then in the kitchen, he'd be at the table, he'd be at the door. Um, so like multiple places, the problem is that setup design makes it brutally hard on all the cast to navigate the floor because you can't step in the wrong spot. You, I mean, besides the fact of injury and falling through a trap door, but they really had to navigate and really plan out and sort of choreograph where they're going to be. And so that's the problem. Like you have a guy who wants to like improvise and, and not rehearse a lot and a cast who needs to rehearse. And you can see some of the problems starting to arise here. So operating Al Fusco was the main operator and he would use his left hand to control Alf's mouth and his right hand would control Alf's right hand. Then Lisa Buckley, the second puppeteer, would control Alf's left hand and help to control things beneath the stage. This is pretty standard for any kind of puppeteering and especially with the Muppets. Any of the big characters would always have like a left hand performer and then the main performer would use obviously the mouth and the right hand. So you'd always have multiple people playing one character it's incredible if you go just go back and see any like you can find on youtube or any of the the videos and production of the muppet movies it the technicality behind it is mind-blowing especially when there's multiple puppets in one room because this means multiple people and they're cramped together down in these little spots and little like cubbies and and whatever and and any shot where like think of the 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 original muppet movie the ending shot when they're on the theater, or if you think of the Muppets take Manhattan at the very end when they're on the church, the amount of people in production that goes into that is incredible. Actually, if you think of the first uh, Muppet movie, hopefully you know it. I'm ashamed if you don't. The initial shot where there's a heli- it's, it's a helicopter shot and it's coming in from the sky and it goes into the swamp and then it's Kermit sitting on a log playing the banjo. Jim Henson is actually in the water underneath it was a real sort of soundstage location it was real water in a real pond and he's in this little pod thing underneath the water operating kermit and trying to perform at the same time so like amazing stuff so that's how they're operating alf that third puppeteer bob fapiano he was the guy in charge of control he, he was in control of alf's facial and ear movements with the remote control that he would use off the stage so when they would do the tapings, uh, Fusco would wear a head-mounted microphone that would record Alf's voice. And, you know, add all this up and you've got a ton of technical problems that it could, t- could occur. And scenes would have to constantly have multiple takes. If you think how much would, you know, you have three people controlling this puppet having to make sure the movements are right. Then you've got a guy with a remote control having to make sure everything is um, synced up on the face and expressions and a guy still trying to do a voice acting performance and then interact. It's crazy. So it was almost impossible to record Alf in front of a live audience. So they had to use a laugh track that, you know, it, it obviously didn't sound much like, if you remember the show, it didn't sound much like a live audience at all. It was obviously canned laughter, but it was hard from a guy who has a real like, production uh, performance background who couldn't do that. They couldn't bring in a live audience. There's just no way they could sit through it. So here's more of the problems with making the show. And <laughs> it's great. You know, the time before the internet, I had no idea. And you probably didn't either about the disaster that was taking place on the set of Alf. But then like no one really did. They were able to keep all those things to themselves. And, you know, years later we were able to find out about, about all the dysfunction that occurred. So, you know, as I mentioned, Alf is an incredibly difficult show to shoot from a technical perspective, and it took so many takes and coordination through the actors' performances that an average 30-minute episode could take 20 to 25 hours to shoot, which is crazy. And when you think back in the 80s when TV shows had at least a 22-episode run, and I think a little more depending on what the orders were for 26 or what a lot of shows now have just like 12 episodes. It seems for an entire season or like a Netflix series has eight episodes or 10 episodes, but they had to crank out a ton. So due to this and probably a combination of all the other factors, there's incredibly high tension on the set. And most of this comes from Max Wright who played Willie and 
he was not <laughs> shy about voicing his dis- displeasure at the frustration of making a show like this. But I mean, you think he would have known what he signed up for. But again, at the same time, if you'd never worked in this dynamic, it's hard to know what to expect. I don't even think the producers and the creators of the show knew what to expect. So his big complaint was that he despised having to cater to an inanimate object that made things a technical nightmare. He also hated that Alf would get all the good lines and apparently just couldn't wait for the show to be done with. There's a story. (laughs) I don't know if this is true. This is told by Artie Lang who worked with Wright on the norm show. I don't know if you remember that short lived show. And he told it, I think he told this on Howard Stern, um, whatever. He said that one night, um, Max Wright actually attacked Alf, the <laughs> either the puppet or the character, and had to be pulled off him. So if that's not one of the funniest things you've ever heard, I don't know. Um, Anne Shadeen once said that on the last night of taping and after the last scene, Max Wright walked off the set to his dressing room, got his bags, and left without saying goodbye to anyone. <laughs> so, And she also shared how the show was a nightmare to shoot. And besides the long and frustrating hours, the set, they said, was joyless. It was hot. It was slow to produce. It was just not um, conducive to a good atmosphere. So, like I said, it's amazing at the time that word didn't get out about how dysfunctional the show was and all the difficult you know, personalities that clash while making it. Andrea Elson, who played Lynn, said she, um, she wasn't thankful the show – or like she was thankful the show didn't go on for another season as everyone would have just completely lost it. So if you're familiar with Alf and if you're not, you remember the very last episode. And I remember this is pretty much anything entertainment based that I remember that happened in the eighties. You, rem- you would no doubt remember this crushing finale, but it was one that was apparently not intended to be the final episode. So in this last show, I'm using this in, in quotes, Alf is contacted by friends from Melmac and they arrange to come pick him up. Alf, you know, he's wrestling with the idea to stay or go, but he decides on trying to restart a life that he once lost. And the alien task force is able to intercept the transmission and they, they find out about the pickup point and all that stuff. So, if you remember back, just, just when Alpha's about to be picked up by the spaceship, the task force busts in to capture Alf, leading him basically defenseless, and the spaceship takes off. And if you enjoyed this show and were a kid, this was soul-crushing, and it was for me. So the, the other problem is there was no follow-up. That was it. There was no fifth season, nothing. Nothing was tied up. A ton of questions weren't answered, and it honestly just sucked. It was like the ending of The Sopranos. Just boom, that was it. I, not just in The Sopranos. <laughs> so it turns out that this finale, again, I'm using this in quotes, was done as a way to create a massive cliffhanger, which it did, so that the network would have to bring back the show for a new season. Uh, so it didn't work, though. I mean, that's basically holding the network at gunpoint, saying we're going to make this show so um, loose-ended that it need, like another season will have to be done. And people will demand, but NBC didn't bow to it and then they lost out. So that led to, and if you remember this, it was called Project Elf. And that was a made-for-TV movie slash sequel that was supposed to wrap up the loose ends of the series and then create some new content because there was still some interest in Elf. And I'll get to more of that in a bit. So this uh, Project Elf was made in 1996 by ABC, but it did not feature any of the original cast. So due to this fact, a lot of people don't consider it connected to the original show at all and that it exists as a standalone project. If you haven't seen it, here's the plot. So the movie starts where the episode ended off. So Alf has been captured by the Air Force and the Alien Task Force are connected and he's being being contained at Edmonds Air Force Base under the control of Colonel Milfoyle It was played by Martin Sheen. So, I mean, Alf remains his usual self. He's able to convince the guards to turn his cell into kind of like a bachelor pad set up, you know, just like how we would at the Tanner's house. And then the plan, the plan in the movie is to have Alf killed under the guise of a beauty treatment testing. And then two scientists at the Air Force Base learn of this and they help Alf to escape. So, 
Alf then uh, he escapes from them while staying in a motel and he ends up going to a strip club for some reason. Then the local police and the military are alerted and a NASA scientist wants to publicly reveal Alf's existence to the world. So it turns out this scientist wants to auction off Alf to the highest bidder. Kind of like the plot for the second Jurassic World. And then, so this doesn't happen. And at the same time, everyone finds out about the plan to have Alf killed. So since Alf has escaped, Milfoil believes he has the right to kill Alf for, and, you know, for doing so because he escaped and whatever. And it turns all the, all this hatred that Milfoil has is because his mother had apparently gone mad due to an alien abduction. The movie ends with Alf being recognized as a global ambassador. So, I like like I said I loved Alf and I remember being kind of psyched for this thing to come out even though I was older and had, you know lost interest but more that it would give a proper closer to that you know inadvertent cliffhanger but when I finally watched it I remember feeling no real connection to it and I think like many others had mentioned it's not canon it's not connected to the original series and it's just hard to get attached when uh, something goes in a separate direction. Uh, you know, nothing's connected to the sitcom. None of the original characters are in it. And it's just sort of a standalone spinoff of sorts, you know, kind of like <laughs> if you've ever seen the Christmas vacation sequel, it's a real thing. Christmas vacation Two: cousin Eddie's Island adventure, you know, stuff that are, that is not Canon is just, it's really hard to get attached to, but then they brought out, and I remember liking this a lot was Alf the Animated Series and actually a pretty decent spinoff and cartoon show in its own right that it actually came out when Alf was still on the air. And I don't remember them having the crossover, but I mean, Alf was so big, they were just trying to hit you in every direction. Um, it was, I'd say, a better than average Saturday morning cartoon. It ran from 1987 um, to 88 on NBC. It took place on Alf's home planet of Melmac. And it w- this is a prequel series, though, that, you know, it took place before Mel Mack would explode and basically follow the life of Alf, his friends, his girlfriend, Rhonda. I, for- I totally forgot. I was looking back into this, that the show was bookended with scenes of like a live action clip of Alf who would talk to the viewers. He would set up the show and then he would discuss it afterwards. And then this led to another spinoff called Alf Tales, which... I don't remember at all, but involved Alf and a bunch of the other characters from season one and put them in place of classic fairy tale characters for some reason. So this was done in an hour long show and was meant to somehow connect season one and two together. So that brings us to a potential Alf reboot. And 2018 was the year of the reboot. There was a bunch of successful um, returns to former shows that were able to capture the public's interest again, like Will and Grace. I mean, the Roseanne reboot that had, you know, how that went, but it, you know, it was huge when it came out. They, uh, Murphy Brown, you know, so TV producers who are desperate for quality network content, content don't seem to be, they're not focused on reboots per se, but more anything that can be successful. I think like, it's so hard to get people's attention now with even just on TV itself with the amount of availability of channels and specialty channels, like just to stand out there is so hard, let alone that you're competing with streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon prime, YouTube itself. Like it's just so hard to stand out. So they, they just, anything that could be successful, they'll take it. They just, I don't think they give a crap if it's, you know, nostalgia or or whatever, if there's interest in it, um, and it happened to be because of a classic show. Perfect. But I don't think they really care. They'll make whatever could be successful. And this may include Alf. So there have been talks since uh, 2012 about turning Alf into a CGI sort of live action type feature film. Sony Pictures Animation had bought the rights to it. But I mean, you know, that was 2012. I think we're still holding uh, holding our breath on that one. But on August 1st, 2018, it was announced that Warner Brothers was going to produce an ALF reboot. The show would focus on ALF returning to Earth, but this time living with a whole new family. So as of November, okay, I'm recording this in March. What is this? March of 2019. As of November 2018, it sounded like this is not moving forward at all. And that was according to TV Line's Michael Osilio. 
um, that the show just wasn't able to pick up um, a suitor. Reminds me of myself. I, I, I'd i love to see a reboot of Alpha. I actually think it could work. There's, I mean, there's clearly an, an interest in old franchises being brought back as evidenced by those shows I had mentioned. Um, I think even doing just one season seems like it would generate a lot of interest, you know, even if it's just for that short time period and be successful. And again, like with network television today, I think it's about getting a quick hit and moving on to something else due to the huge amount of competition out there that we've just already discussed. Um, also the fact not a lot of people really watch a lot of live TV anymore. I don't know. You might, I just thinking that the other day, I don't besides sports, I don't watch anything live on TV anymore at all. I it's either DVR or I'll rewatch it online or I'll record it and watch it later. So I think it's kind of a, I think with Alf it would work in, and ultimately it would probably work best as a Netflix series, whether it's even just an eight episode special <clears throat> kind of like one big hit, take the money and run. Don't try and drag it out. Don't try and do five or six seasons and what, unless there's a huge interest and in it's actually very successful and it, and it's, um, creative and it works and everything like that. I, I think, I honestly think they could, they could do one, a one shot season and get out pretty unscathed, but you know, what do I know? <laughs> so I'll start wrapping it up here. Some final thoughts. And, you know, like I said, this is one of my all time favorite shows. I remember camping in the backyard with my neighbor once because of an episode on Alf. They did that. Th- that's how attached to this show I was. And like I said, I think I was just at the right age for it when it debuted in 1986 and that, that humor and the tone of the show connected with me very well. And it, like, I just thought it, it just tapped into my own sensibilities and my own sense of humor. Um, and I don't know, it just, you know, it's about building connections with audiences and I don't know what their target demographic was. I obviously that would, would appeal to families and kids. And I think it really did that. And the funny thing is like Elf never seems to die off as it's been, it's been more than 30 years and it still comes up in, in some form. So the interest hasn't seemed to really go away. He, Alf is still used in commercials and the odd network show. He was in the Super Bowl commercial. Like, what was that? Not that long ago, maybe four or five years ago. I think was it was the Radio Shack one. Um, you know, it was that nostalgia. I think Hulk Hogan was in it too, but there's just always been that little bit of interest. And then, this is uh Tina Fey tells a story about, I don't know if you saw the NBC 75th anniversary special and about how hard it was um, to actually work with Alf and to work with Alf's people. So um, she said how that Tina, she said that Paul Fusco would only allow Alf to appear on the show if the puppeteers were allowed to hide from everyone else. So then Alf makes a cameo. I don't know if you remember this. He makes a cameo alongside Michael Gross from Family Ties. Then he disappears through a riser, was stuffed into a suitcase, and immediately removed from the building. So the original prima donna for an inanimate object. Okay, so that's it on Alf. Hopefully you liked that and learned a little bit about this show. If you want to see the full article blog I had based on this and some more like pictures and little video clips, you can go to the show notes, which has all that together. So that's everything eighties podcast.com slash nine. So again, thank you for listening. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there and just the fact you're listening to this one means a lot. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I'm there. If you really like it, give it a rating and review that way. More people get to see it. Okay. I'm out. See you later.